In today's episode, to celebrate National Preservation Month, we'll get an update on the Kramer House and Flower Shop from Wendy Pettit, host of the Demolished Salt Lake podcast. And later, we will have the pleasure of talking to preservation legend and national hero, Bob Yap. But first, I'm Stacy Grinsfelder. And I'm Daniel Cantor. And this is True Tales from Old Houses, episode 97. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Stacy. How you doing? What's up? I'm good. I am very excited about today's show because we have preservation legend Bob Yap on. Very exciting. I know. I'm a little nervous. Starstruck. <laughs> but before we launch into today's episode, I do want to say thank you to our season nine sponsors, The Craftsman Store, Sutherland Wells, Preservin, and Abitron. We are so lucky to have them this season. Yes, thank you to our sponsors. We're huge fans. So we'll get to our interviews with Wendy and Bob really soon, but we do have a few announcements. During episode 96, we talked about having merchandise, doing the merch run, and we also talked about having the giveaways. Both of those were supposed to be live on Friday, May 12th. I had some website issues. Those did not get up on that day, but they're both available now. So to explain a little bit more, the merch run runs between now and May 31st. And what we do is, since we're not a store and we don't have merchandise to ship you immediately, we don't take your money right away. We just take your pre-order. And once that pre-order period is over, then I place the order for everything. And once it arrives here from my local printer, then I'll send an invoice to you for Venmo or PayPal, whichever you prefer, and then your merch will ship right away. If you are in New York, we do have to charge applicable sales tax because we do want to keep everything on the up and up. Exactly. So I think I said this before too, but the reason that it's a little bit more of a complex process is because we're not using a drop shipping service. Stacy selects all of these things and they are really high quality. They're printed locally to, to her. And yeah, so all the merch is really, really nice and get after it. You have what, two weeks, a little less than two weeks. Yeah. Get your pre-orders in and rock your merch. Drop shipping's fine, but I find that we just have more quality control if we do it this way. And if you're interested in merchandise, you can go to truetalesfromoldhouses.com slash merch. In addition, the entry links for our 100th episode giveaway are live. So those giveaways include one free enrollment in the window course from our friend Scott Seidler of the Craftsman blog. There's also a woodworker's sample kit from Sutherland Wells. On top of that, there is a liquid wood and wood epox restoration kit from Abitron, a division of UC Coatings. And then there also is a True Tales from Old Houses hoodie or t-shirt of your choice, which is slightly different than what we sold you last time, but still great. I know last time we said that it was a merch item of your choice, but I had to narrow it down to a hoodie or a t-shirt just because that's the way the ordering was going to work. But you can get the size and color of your choice. That should be no problem at all. Nice. So if you're interested in entering the giveaway, one or all of them, you're welcome to do all four. Go to truetalesfromoldhouses.com slash giveaway. We are rounding the bend to our 100th episode, and Daniel and I have decided that we are going to revisit some of our past guests. Yeah, I think this is a really fun plan. The show has been on for nine seasons, almost nine entire seasons now. So many guests to circle back with. So if there are particular people that you would really love to hear updates on or hear from again, let us know. How should people let us know, Stacey? TrueTalesFromOldHouses.com slash contact. There's a contact form right there. And Daniel and I have each picked a favorite that we want to go back and revisit but we definitely want to hear from you. You may have noticed in your favorite podcasting app or service of choice that Stacy and I dropped a second mini-sode last week. So it is up and available to listen to. I believe it is 28 solid minutes of uh, just wonderful chit-chat. And I think we may have started a cult toward the very beginning. 
So you'll really have to listen to find out. We're really enjoying doing them. So let us know if you have feedback, I guess good or bad. We mostly like praise and I hope people are enjoying them. They're fun to record. I like talking to you, so... Yeah, same here. Also, when you're listening, if you would like to leave us ratings and reviews, we really love that. That tells everybody that True Tales from Old Houses is worth a listen, and it brings our show higher in the rankings. We would love that. We would love to get more listeners and have more old house lovers like you be our friends. All the way to the top. That's where we're going. (laughs) All the way to the top. With this episode, we do have Wendy, we have Bob, so we just have time for a little quick update from each of us. So why don't you start? All right, real quick, I'm really excited because Cheap Old Houses, who Ethan and Elizabeth Finkelstein run that account, and they are lovely people, they have a book coming out, and my house is actually in it, so they came and photographed back in the fall, and so they've kind of just announced it, you can pre-order it. This is not an ad, but we are happy to support them. They've been on the show before. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see this thing. I've never... Nobody's ever photographed my house other than me, so. Wow, that's really special. Yeah, the photographer was so great. She was really awesome, and and I'm like, you know, welcome, and she's going around, and I was like, so what have you been, you know, working on lately? And she's like, oh, well, so, you know, the Architectural Digest that just came out, Nate Berkus is on the cover, so, like, I shot that house. And then I'm like, oh, no, (laughs) now you're in my little (laughs) hovel over here, but... Oh, that's neat. I'm excited to see the book. We'll drop a link. We'll drop a pre-order link in the show notes. That's no problem. And Elizabeth, yeah, she's been on the show twice. And that's great. A lot of fun. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. It'll be fun to see. And if you are in this space at all on like Instagram and stuff, many of the people you follow will also be in the book. So it's it's pretty cool. It'll be fun to see everyone else's things. And neat. Of course, I'm very excited to see what what pictures of my dogs make it in. <laughs> That's the thing I really care about. What about you? What you been up to? All I'm doing right now is rehearsing for my speech for the Missouri Preservation Conference. That's it. That is what my life looks like right now. I'm writing a speech, I'm rehearsing a speech, and I'm very excited about it. But I don't have any house stuff to report because most of my projects that I've started, for one reason or another, just aren't going that great. But we'll get there. Yeah. So you'll have this speech fully memorized, ready to recite. Yeah, that's the idea for sure. Are you really going to memorize the speech? Yes, but I do have cues because I have a PowerPoint presentation as well. So it will be memorized, but hopefully those visual cues will remind me of where I'm going with all this. (laughs) Wow. I was kidding when I said you were going to memorize it, but... Oh, yeah. Go big or stay home. You're a good student. Okay, well, we do need to take a break, Daniel, but Wendy Pettit is up next with an update on the historic Kramer House and Flower Shop. Stacy, you want to switch it up? We'll switch parts. Yeah, let's do it. Making our own fun. True Tales from Old Houses is supported by The Craftsman Store, another excellent resource from our friend Scott Seidler of The Craftsman Blog. The Craftsman Store is your go-to place for old house tools and supplies. Once again, our friend Scott has taken the hassle out of tracking down the specialized old house supplies we need and put it all in one place for us. It's a cozy little online hardware store full of books, tools, and replacement parts. So Stacy buys her window restoration supplies from the Craftsman store, and I intend to when I finally get around to restoring my windows. And that will include diamond glazing points, which can be very difficult to find. Scott runs a top-notch small business. The customer service is an actual human. They ship quickly. You will love your experience shopping with them. From window restoration to plaster repair, they have everything you need to do the job like a pro. So check it out today at thecraftsmanstore.com and save 10% on your order if you use the code TRUETALES. True Tales from Old Houses is also supported by Preservin, a unique preservation franchise opportunity developed by longtime window restoration pro Ty McBride. The mission of Preservin is to save the future by preserving the past. Daniel, what exactly is Preservin? 
So you've been telling me for like, I think, what, seven weeks now? So I can tell you that Preservin is a franchise for wood rot repair in buildings old and new. Ty started Preservin in Oklahoma, but you can now open a Preservin franchise anywhere in the country. As a franchise owner, the team at Preservin will train and equip you with the tools that you need to perform sustainable wood rot repairs and build your own team of epoxy techs. So you will receive the playbook for a proven preservation business, exclusive access to ever resin epoxy products, business software, and all of the marketing, advertising, training, and technical support that you need. The Preservin family is focused on creating work-life balance while serving your neighbors and community in a recession-proof industry. Those are values that Ty holds dear, and he wants you to be able to work your own hours and spend the rest of the time in ways that are important to you. So to learn more about becoming part of the Preservin family and their mission, go to Preservin Franchise, that's P-R-E-S-E-R-V-A-N, PreservinFranchise.com slash True Tales. We are back. So let's give some quick context to the Kramer House and Flower Shop. I remember, but remind the listeners what this building is. So this is a tiny little building that I found in Salt Lake City. I was walking with Andy and it was just between these two giant skyscrapers. And I was pretty sure that it was destined for historic building heaven, but it was not. And Wendy Pettit is here with an update for us. Hi, I'm Wendy Pettit and I am the host of the Demolish Salt Lake podcast. Welcome, Wendy. Hi, Wendy. Good to meet you. It's nice to meet you both. Thank you for having me on. Well, Wendy, you are here today, and I'm quite excited about this because a few episodes ago, and Daniel, I honestly can't remember. Can you remember which episode it was where we talked about the Christopher Kramer house? It was the historic Murray First Foundation episode, so maybe the 94? I'm going to go with 94. 94. All right, we'll correct that if we're wrong. So anyway, a few episodes ago, we talked about the Christopher Kramer house, which was this cute little historic building that I saw in Salt Lake City nestled between giant skyscrapers. I fell in love with it. I took lots of pictures of it. I was sure it was going to be destroyed. And then, Wendy, you came through and saved the day and told me that it was indeed being saved. And then Daniel had some questions and I had questions. So you're here to follow up on that. Go for it. Tell us what you know about it. To start with Christopher Kramer, because he's, you know, the big guy of the story, right? Sure. He's a Danish immigrant and came to Salt Lake in like the 1850s. Actually settled down in central Utah with all the rest of the Scandinavian immigrants. Because (laughs) if you ever go to central Utah, go to the cemeteries. It's lousy with Scandinavian immigrants. (laughs) 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 That's just where they settled. That is my heritage. Like Danish and Swedish. And they came and they settled in Manti, Utah. Which is where Christopher actually settled was in Manti, Utah. So he got married. Had a family. Unfortunately, his wife passed away. He remarried, and unfortunately, he had a son that passed away. That's kind of some of his story. They, Him and his wife had a lot of kids, and only four of them lived to adulthood. So while he was in Manti, I found him in the, in the census, and hit the census in, 19, in, oh, sorry, in 1880 has him as a carpenter, but... According to something else I found, he was also a florist. So I think that maybe between 1880 and the time that he decided to come up to Utah, he became a florist. Okay. Before he came up to Salt Lake City? Salt Lake. Yes. Sorry. Before he came up to Salt Lake City. Right. So the first mention of Christopher Kramer I found in Salt Lake City was in 1887. And the newspaper article states that he had petitioned the city to allow him to use a street corner to sell his floral arrangements because he had no other way of providing for his family than that. And I guess his fortunes turned because we know that in in 1890, he built what is now the Christopher Kramer House. Yes, that's the building that I saw. Right. And this is a mid-block street. I mean, it's nothing more than an alleyway today. But back then, it was an actual mid-block street that went all the way through. So he built his home there. 
The top floor was for him and his family to live in, and the bottom floor was where he had his floral shop. Mm. I checked with my friend about the style of the building because I wasn't quite sure. And he said that what it is, it is false front commercial style. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, I guess it was pretty popular in the West after the gold rush of 1849. So the building, it was meant to have the front of the building look really nice and neat and be able to build other buildings to look the same while the sides and the back could be completely devoid of any interesting features. I've never heard that term. I love that. False front commercial. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That was new for me. I hadn't heard about that style before. And Daniel, didn't you have a question about, remember you had a pretty big question about the flowers. When I moved to Kingston, there was a turn of the century florist shop. It had been open for, I think, 97 years and it eventually closed and now it's like a pizza place. But I remember researching it a little bit because I'm like, what is a 19th or late early 20th century florist shop look like? Where are they getting the flowers? Like, how does that work? And so I can't remember what I read, like fresh flowers were kind of typically purchased for, but it was very rare. And then also that in these days before, you know, quick shipping and air flight and stuff, you would have to kind of grow the flowers locally. So this florist here in Kingston had like 50,000 square feet of greenhouse space sort of up in this area a little ways away. And I actually went out into the woods and found it and it was really cool. Like it's all ruins, but it's cool. You can see where they were. So I was wondering, I guess is a long-winded way of asking, what do you know about like the culture of flower giving and receiving and also where were they getting the flowers? So I don't know too much about flower giving and receiving. It seems like the flowers were pretty expensive right. back then. And I think that he did it more for like commercial use or for parties or for maybe it was for more of the upper echelon class, like a, a lady's tea party or a funeral. So I don't know if it how that worked with like individuals going in and buying. That's an interesting thing. I may have to look into that a little bit more. This might be the ongoing story from this podcast. A long time ago, it was the, it was the Christmas tree from Halifax. And this whole can of worms might be the, where flowers are grown and who were they given to at that time. So, but anyway, go ahead, Wendy. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, but I can answer your question about the greenhouse. The lovely Sanborn fire insurance map saved the day on this one. And I love those. Those are my jam, right? He had a glass uh, greenhouse right next to his house. Wow. So right on that same little block. Yep. (laughs) Yep. So the block, the parcel where his house was located was a pretty big parcel when he owned the house. So it was his house. And then right next door was where he grew his flowers in his greenhouse. Wow. That's convenient. What else did you find out about him that might be interesting for people listening? So he didn't live in the house very long. It was only seven years later that he sold the house. The whole building. The whole building, the whole parcel and everything. And it's really interesting because in the newspaper for the real estate transfer section, it said that he sold the house for $1. Now, I don't know if that's a typo or if he actually did sell everything for $1, but he did. Like, that sounds like a transfer. Yeah, it's like a deed transfer. Right, a deed transfer. So he moved his business out to what was then the outskirts of town and built a new house and then built like seven greenhouses. So he had this huge lot of land. So I'm assuming that's probably why he sold his house. There just wasn't enough room, but he could go you know, out there, which now is not the outskirts of town. It's still, (laughs) it's very much considered in town, (laughs) but that's where he built. And he lived there and ran his greenhouse and his, uh, his floral shop until he retired in 1924. Interesting. That was the end of the Kramer floral business was in 1924. So I guess the ultimate follow-up to that now, Christopher Kramer's flower shop and house is no longer, but that little building is still there. And I believe they just did an opening dedication, didn't they? Right. So the cool thing about the Kramer house 
is that it is one of two historic residential houses left in downtown Salt Lake. And it's one of the oldest continuously lived in houses in Salt Lake, too. So at one time, it was like a piano shop or a radio shop. But other than that, it was always lived in. Is it still residential? It is not. And I couldn't find when the last people lived in the house. But I'm pretty sure it's been vacant for a while. At some point, the city purchased the building. So it was actually owned by the city, which is why it hasn't been demolished. Like, I'm surprised. I am I am completely shocked. All around it is development. Right. That's what Stacy was saying. It's the only original building left on Floral Street. It was shocking to me because when I went, when I saw it, it turns out it was being restored. But when I saw it, it was in quite a state. Like the windows were gone. There was tape all over. I was pretty sure that they were just going to be destroying everything. That those X's were like, you know, marked for death. I figured that the, <laughs> the bulldozer was coming at any moment. But it turns out the windows were out and there were replacements in there because they were being repaired and fixed and rehabbed. And so it's cute. They painted it blue, which makes me a little... Cranky, yeah. but I can overlook <laughs> it because the building is still there. But the next time in Salt Lake, I will definitely take pictures again and share them. And that was that was a lot of fun. Stacy, I hate to point out, but is your house not blue? My house is blue, but my house is also not brick. Oh, oh, I yeah. see. I still have not seen a picture of this building. So, Stacy, can we go see a picture of this house somewhere? Yes, I will put another one up uh, on the show notes on True Tales from Old Houses. And when I go back to Salt Lake City, I'll take an updated picture and maybe Wendy and I will go and have a cup of coffee or something. Yes, because the building itself is being turned into a bar. It's going to be ran by another local bar called Water Witch, which is a really fantastic place. So they are going to, it's, it's being renovated right now. And hopefully soon we can go over and get a get a drink out of it and enjoy the history of the Kramer house. I would love that. Thank you so much for updating us, Wendy. This is great. I'm happy to help. Thank you for doing all that research. You're welcome. Now I can turn this into an episode for my podcast. Yeah, you should. <laughs> all right. Thanks again. Thank you. Well, that was fun having Wendy here, but we do need to take another quick break. Yeah, that was super cool. Now we will tell you some more things. True Tales from Old Houses is supported by Sutherland Wells. All of the Sutherland Wells products are handcrafted in Providence, Rhode Island with the highest quality, sustainably grown tongue oil. Tongue oil, which is native to China, has been used for centuries as a durable finish for wood, metal, and stone. Unlike polyurethane, tongue oil finish penetrates the surface of the wood so it flexes and contracts as the conditions change, making it the perfect pre-finish or protectant for everything from fine furniture to window sash and sills. So you keep talking about your friend, the woodworker who's been making this cabinet for his daughter. I think the last we heard, there's uh, maple and walnut involved. Do we have updates? Yes, he used the Sutherland Wells wiping varnish, which I talked about last time, and he actually just last weekend delivered this beautiful cabinet to his daughter, and she loves it. Oh, that's so nice. Of course she does, because it's Sutherland Wells finishing products. So even though my friend chose the wiping varnish, Sutherland Wells has an entire product line for whatever you're working on right now. Siding, hardwood floors, furniture restoration, cutting boards, you name it. To learn more about the complete product line, visit Sutherland Wells, that's W-E-L-L-E-S, SutherlandWells.com. And to save 10% on your first order, use the coupon code TRUETALES. True Tales from Old Houses is supported by Abitron, which is now a division of UC Coatings. Abitron manufactures two of our favorite products on the planet, which are liquid wood and wood epochs. Stacy has talked at length about these products on Instagram. I've used them plenty of times, and uh, they are amazing to repair wood rot on windows and doors. Exactly. Now, I had planned to tell you more about my experience with ABBA Weld 55.1, but unfortunately, our weather has been abysmal, so that will have to wait until the next episode. I can't wait to hear all about it. 
Liquid wood and wood epox products make permanent, cost-effective repairs wherever you find rotted or damaged wood. And whether you're a first-timer or a professional tradesperson, Abitron products are super easy to use. The instructions are really simple, and the results are absolutely exceptional. There is no shrinking or sagging, and repairs can be sanded and painted exactly like wood. In addition to wood repair, Abitron also offers other great products for old homes, specifically for concrete repair, like the Abo Weld 55 one I mentioned, plaster repair, window glazing, and more. Check out their website at abitron.com or follow them on Instagram at abitron underscore UC or on Facebook at Abitron, a division of UC Coatings. From now until June 3rd, Abitron has a special coupon code for True Tales from Old Houses listeners. Enter WOOD10 at abitron.com for 10% off your order. That's WOOD10 to save 10% on your order at abitron.com. Our guest today is Bob Yap. Bob is the president of the National Historic Preservation Consulting Firm, Preservation Resources Incorporated. He conducts hands-on preservation events in cities and towns across America. Bob also founded and teaches at his school in Hannibal, Missouri, the Belvedere School for Hands-On Preservation. My name is Bob Yap, and I live in Hannibal, Missouri. Bob Yap is here. Bob Yap is here. Oh my gosh, I have been wanting to do this forever, Bob, and I am so, so thrilled that you are here. Thank you. I'm extremely thrilled to be here, honestly. Uh, You have a great program. It's promoting good stewardship of old and historic properties, and, and in my world, it doesn't get any better than that. Okay, that's our full endorsement. Bob Yap has endorsed our show, and that's that's all we have to do today. We're good. Yeah, right, yeah. Because Bob's a legend in his own mind, right? I think in a lot of people's minds, you're a legend, Bob. Can I call you Bob? Am I allowed? No, the only people that call me Mr. Yap are cops when they stop me for speeding. Okay. <laughs> and I'm semi from Missouri, and I know that that's probably pretty common in Hannibal, because it seems like there's more traffic stops in the state of Missouri than anywhere I've ever lived. <laughs> well, I'm not, it's interesting. I was born in Kirkwood, St. Louis, but I was raised in Des Moines, Iowa. Oh, which is one of one of the most interesting and progressive cities in the country that nobody knows about. I think I went through there once. I think I drove through on the way to my grandma's house. She lives in northern Missouri, but I I haven't spent a lot of time there. Yeah, it's an amazing place. A lot of artisan trades people. I mean, a culture of artisan trades. So I have to ask, now that you've been in Missouri for quite some time, do you call it Missouri or Missouri? <laughs> so my dad and mom were from Manhattan, Kansas. I was born in St. Louis. My father called the headquarters for the company that he ran a division of and said, I'm moving the headquarters to Des Moines, and if you don't like it, you can fire me. And they're like, whoa, 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 (laughs) what what, what, what are you talking about? And he said, I I hate people from Missouri. (laughs) And I said, so later in life, I said, what was that all about? He said, oh, you know, the border wars between Missouri and and Kansas. They tried to get us to be a slave state, and we didn't want to be. And, uh, you know, people were killed. And, and so I hate people from Missouri. He's rolling over in his grave now. I keep hitting my computer. Sorry about that. He's rolling over in his grave, but he, he'll be all right. We actually picked Hannibal, Missouri over. We looked at Louisville. We looked at Seattle, Minneapolis, back to Des Moines, Chicago, a whole bunch of different cities to open my preservation trade school. And we picked Hannibal. And uh, part of that has to do with the international tourism base here is for a town of 18,000, that's between 60 and 80 million a year in international tourism. And my wife wanted to open her bed and breakfast when she retired as an old school Chicago social worker. And that's what we're doing. Very cool. That's wonderful. We traveled through Hannibal once. I'm sorry, we travel a lot. But I I remember because I had my kids with me and there's a little Mark Twain thing in Hannibal, like a little, it reminds me of a roadside attraction. And then my kids practiced painting the fake fence. You know, they have paintbrushes out there and there's the story of, of, (laughs) that was cute. That's the downtown area. It's Mark Twain's boyhood home and a whole bunch of other structures around he and his family. And it's not on the National Register of Historic Places. It's a National Historic Landmark, same status as the Lincoln Memorial. So it's a, it's a fairly big deal. And, you know, they still teach 
Twain all over Europe and East and Asia, China, Vietnam, all over Europe. And about two thirds of the schools in this country don't teach Twain at all anymore. So sad. Yeah. So is a lot of that tourism, international tourists coming in? Yeah. Yeah. So probably about a, I think 20 to 30 percent of it is international, which is astonishing. So we having a bed and breakfast, we get to meet some of the most amazing humanoids as you can even imagine. So. Wow. So many, so many stories I'm sure you hear all the time. Boy, that's no lie. <laughs> <laughs> some of them are true, too. <laughs> you know. That sounds very Twain-esque, actually. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> it's sort of, I, I actually play Mark Twain all summer. Oh, do you? There was an actor and director named Orson Welles. Sure. Eh? I'm sure you've all heard of him. Yes. And he did a radio drama. I think he performed it once and never did it again, and it was hardly ever heard, called Huck. And a friend of mine here in town that is a Mark Twain uh, impersonator for the museum and um, the Mark Twain Cave, he got the rights to it. And, he, and we had this group called Muddy River Radio. Uh, and we were doing live radio dramas in front of audiences every week. I mean, we have a sound effects guy and we have a, a band and the whole works. And we were doing stories about the Mississippi River and some old time radio dramas. And he said, do you want to, want to do this Huck thing? I said, sure. Can I be one of the scallywags down on the river? And he said, no, no, no there's a narrator and it's Twain and I want you to be Twain. And I'm like, Oh, no pressure there, Mr. Twain, <laughs> you know, but we do it for, we do it for the river boats. So it's really fun. Oh, that's neat. So Daniel, you know what I'm going to say, right? I think that we have to add Hannibal to our road trip itinerary. <laughs> yes. But I also have something oh, else I'm going to oh. say. Daniel and I have been, I think we're like 95% serious about doing this. But on the first show of this season, somebody wrote in and said that they had read or they had seen the movie George Washington Slept Here or Slept There. I can't remember what it's called. And it's an actual play. So I got the playbooks and I have this dream now of Daniel and I and some other people doing a live, basically, radio drama. It's actually a comedy of this George Washington slept here, uh, doing it for charity. So every time we get somebody on the show who who expresses even just the slightest little bit of drama background, we're like, okay, you're in it, you're in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fun for us because, uh, you know, we get to act and ham it up and do all that. And we have old time microphones and the sound effects guy and and the audiences just love it. And, and they actually pay us to do it, you know, so go figure. Oh, what a blast. I love that you were nervous about the radio show. You do recall, sir, you had a television series for years. Well, and I had a syndicated radio show, too. That's true, right. Actually, I like radio because, you know, you don't have to... I shave this morning, you know, once a month, whether I need to or not, because I thought I was going to be on, and I am, I'm on video, right? So, you know, radio, it doesn't matter what you look like. You just hit, you know, if you have to make some sort of, like, if you have to belch or something, you just hit the, you know, the mute button, right? quite familiar. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we love podcasting. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Well, what was it like doing the TV show? Did you enjoy that? You know, the TV show was really interesting. I was doing um, the House Doctor radio show and the syndicator for that came to me and said, you know, why don't you do a video of the top 10 questions that people ask you? And I said, can I put my wife Pat in it? Because, you know, her job is to give me a hard time and, uh, you know, we used to get a lot of letters and uh, Bob's OK, but we love it when Pat gives him a hard time, you know. <laughs> so we did the top 10 uh, tips for a healthy home uh, video for the radio show. And one day I get a call and the guy says, hi, is this Bob Yap? I said, yes, it is. And he said, well, I'm such and such from I'm the president of PBS programming. And I said, Jim, quit messing with me. And I hung <laughs> up on it because I thought it was my buddy, Jim messing with me and the guy called me back he said don't hang up it really is pbs we have your pilot and we love it and i said i've never done a pilot i don't know what you're talking about he said well the top 10 tips for a healthy home i said oh the video we did for the radio show he said yeah he said, i want you to come out to dc so it started by that and they offered me the show on every pbs station in the country but no money so I went to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and that was an interesting process because at that point in time, uh, Richard Moe was the president of the National Trust, and Dick was a 
a wild advocate for historic preservation trades because he understood that the preservation movement doesn't exist without the artisan preservation trades. It just doesn't. It went to the board and about half the board said, nah, he's a plain spoken Midwestern guy, you know, preservation's an exclusive club and, you know, rah, 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 rah. And the other half said, no, 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 this guy is like speaking to the average old house owner. We ought to get on board with this. So we aren't an exclusive club. And then they sent out the video to all the ex officio board members. And usually ex officio board members are people that are very famous, that can bring some gravitas to the board. And, that kind of, and this one dude sends a letter to the board and says, no, I, I really think you need to do this. And if you don't, I may have to resign. Wow. And it was a guy named Walter Cronkite. Oh, my God. <laughs> I know. I've never wow. met him. I've heard of him. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, and so they voted to to be my first underwriter. And then I was able to take that and go to the Ace Hardwares and the different places like that and get all the underwriting we need to do the show. So it was an interesting experience. It was four years of virtually never seeing my kids or my wife on the road. You know, and I'm very, I'm a stickler. I mean, you know, the, the production values back then, PBS had, had what we call the Red Book. And it was much more stringent than than commercial television. You couldn't have any dropouts. And so the production values were, they weren't gr the greatest in the world because, you know, it is what it is, but I thought they were pretty good. And uh, we had great crews and uh, lots of different fun, interesting people um, that would uh, come in and out of the show. But it, w it was, you know, it's funny because I thought, okay, man, this is cool. I'm sort of like an old hippie. PBS is like an old hippie, kind of altruistic, you know, win-win kind of thing. And it's going to be like really groovy, right? And uh, it ended up being uh, very cutthroat. And um, several entities tried to steal the show from me. And I had to hire attorneys and fight them. And wow. I, got, I had an agent steal a quarter of a million dollars. I, it just a whole bunch of different things happened. And we survived through it. And we ended up uh, doing 52 shows and all, like a about seven or eight pledge specials. And uh, it was an interesting experience. I, I loved it because we were getting to millions of people every week. You know, we were running anywhere between a million, five million viewers a week. And that's some weeks it was a lot more than Jay Leno was bringing in or this yeah. old box. I mean, this old house. I mean, whatever that show's called. <laughs> that one. <laughs> I'm, I think, though, I mean, Walter Cronkite, he was onto something because I think one of the things that you did so well on that show was be really approachable. And I don't know what was going, well, I guess I kind of now, now know, but behind the scenes, but in front of the camera, you were, you really were having fun with it. It was light. It was like, this was inspiring. I mean, I came up while the show was on. So I appreciate that. Uh, that was my goal. My goal was to make it approachable by the average old house owner. And they didn't necessarily know they had a historic right. house where they didn't necessarily they didn't understand the difference between a, a national register or a local landmark. They didn't understand any of that. And my goal was to kind of kind of walk them through, talk to them, not down to them, show them different ways to do things. Maybe you can't afford this expensive tool. Well, here's a less expensive tool that you can use that will get you to the same place. So, yeah, from that perspective and, and getting that wide of an audience really blew my mind because I'm thinking, OK, I'm a radio guy. Right. And I was a, a writer for the uh, newspapers and I wrote a lot of articles and magazines and television. That's a whole different animal. But I got to tell you, I have to tell you, the minute the camera came on the first time, I felt like I'd been in front of it all my life. I don't know why. I have no idea. You know, maybe it's all those theater classes my mom had me take when I was a kid. So. Yeah, no, I, I mean, so natural. And I think it was what you had to do was really difficult because not only were you sort of showing people how to what to do, you were showing people what not to do. And in many cases, it's things that they maybe have done or thought about doing. So like you were fighting the good fight on vinyl siding and windows in the mid 90s. And to me, that. That Back in the day, right? right? Well, yeah, now it is. But it feels to me like that is a very current conversation and wasn't really in the consciousness back then. So I guess I'm wondering, do you feel like you got blowback at the time? And I guess I wonder if that's changed. Well, I, I, honestly, I'm not on PBS because of that. Really? Wow. Yes. So I get called up and... Um, 
PBS and Ace Hardware were my, t- uh, you know, PBS was, you know, the station, the, the network, and then Ace Hardware was my biggest uh, underwriter. And the ratings, uh, Nielsen's had come in. I didn't even know they did Nielsen ratings on PBS. I just, like I said, I thought it was this altruistic kind of thing, you know. And they said, you know, you, you've got millions of people. This is the most popular home improvement show in the history of television right this moment. And this is in 1999. And I said, you got to be kidding me. I, I mean, honestly, I did not realize that. I said, well, that's just wonderful. So I'm glad you're happy. And they said, well, but, you know, there's a problem. And I said, well, and this is Ace. They're marketing people. You're slamming vinyl windows and vinyl siding a lot. And I said, well, it's a historic preservation show. Our, our first underwriter was the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Have you ever watched the show? And they said, well, of course, of course we have, you know, but about a third of our Ace dealers sell both those products. So we want you to start promoting them on the show. Oh, no. I said, well, that's just never going to happen. I've just spent four years and 10 years on the radio telling people never to use that garbage. I mean, it wasn't even a a consideration on my side. And um, at that point, I got up and I walked out and never looked back. Good for you. That was in around 2000. I'm glad I did because the next phase for me was actually getting out face to face with people all over the country. So I feel really honored to have gotten into the homes of and up front with what I'm doing now, literally millions of people. There are days when I wonder if I've actually had an effect. And my wife laughs at me. She says, every time you go to a preservation conference, all your former students, all, all your, the older folks that watched your show, they just circle around you and they've all gone on to do great things. And I said, well, okay, you're right. That makes me feel good. So I'm glad to see that because the biggest problems that we have in this country is we've done a really great job with preservation in so many ways. But where we've really fallen down is that we have suggested, we have required and or mandated that people do certain things that live in either historic uh, local landmarks or local historic districts, but we haven't trained enough people to be able to do the work cost effectively and efficiently. And that is a huge issue that I've been addressing all my adult life. And now I'm starting to see other, like the guy that did dirty jobs, now all of a sudden he's doing it. And that's great. I'm glad that he's promoting trades uh, work and those kinds of things. But I promote something a little different. I promote the historic preservation trades, because if we look at 60 plus percent of our housing is over 50 years old in this country, we need to take care of these properties. We're what I call the McDonald's syndrome in this country. We want it fast. We want it cheap. And we don't want to lift a finger. And there is no such thing as a home with no maintenance. But we need to do a better job of training people. So what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. And I'm hearing this, and I, it's been something that's been going around in my head, too. And I think that's really where a lot of the friction is between people who own historic homes that are required to do certain things, because they can't just call someone to come over and do it, because that person who could restore their windows or their doors or put things back to be, you know, period specific, that person doesn't exist everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so they're forced to come up with a solution to a problem that they don't think is important. So, yeah, if you're sitting on a historic preservation commission and you have an ordinance that says that you have to have, keep the original wood windows unless you can demonstrate that they can't be saved. And then if you're going to replace them, you have to put a wood window in and there's no one that does it. What's that commissioner supposed to do? What's that that property owner supposed to do? So I spend a lot of time, cities hire me half the year, and I travel like an old circuit rider uh, with an entire truck filled with a woodworking shop, and I go from city to city, and I train people how to do cost-effective rehab work on buildings. A lot of small contractors, homeowners, and then I do it at the school as well here in Hannibal, so... Huh. Amazing. Wow. My mind is kind of blown. Yeah. I'm just sitting here like, what? <laughs> but no, you've actually, that was a puzzle piece that I didn't have. And just listening to you say that has made a lot of, it makes a lot of sense to me. I think, you know, people perceive that preservation is expensive. And really, it's the big lie in America today. My, I have a dear friend named Donovan Ripkema. He's a, he's a preservation economist, uh, place economics out in D.C. He's originally from South Dakota. 
And he's internationally known for doing really good data about what the economic benefits of historic preservation, as well as other real estate issues. But he's really honed in in the last 20 years on preservation. So he said, well, look, Bob, you've done, you know, over 100, you've been involved in over 160 ground up rehabs of historic properties. Have you kept good records? I said, yeah, meticulous notebooks and all the accounting information. So said, well, if you're slow in the winter, you ought to check out a couple of things. Find out what it's cost you per square foot to do your projects on average, average it all out. And then what your average percentage was for labor on preservation projects. So I did this. 72.3% of my projects went to labor. Uh-huh. Now, hmm. new construction is about 40%. So we're creating more jobs. And my per cost, my square foot cost to do all these projects all over the Midwest has never exceeded $100 a square foot. Now, you can't build anything. I'm building a brand new house now. It's going to cost me close to $200 a square foot because of all the new materials that I'm having to put in from just scratch, right? Instead of maintaining or preserving Right. What we have. So yes. Not to mention, you got to put in a whole foundation and frame the whole thing. And Absolutely. The, yeah. In a garage, carriage house reproduction. and But, you know, we can talk about that house in a minute if you want. I guess my question is, so what you're really saying is that labor costs are higher, but actual materials are lower and it kind of even, evens out. Well, of course, because we're not replacing everything, number one, and we're not building new. So we're, we're, we're maintaining and preserving as much of the original material as we possibly can. We're updating kitchens and we're doing putting bathrooms in houses that didn't have them. Mm-hmm. That's something that's really interesting to me, too, is rehabilitation as opposed to restoration. Very different. Restoration, if I had restored this 1859 house, I'm down in my shop right now. We would have had outhouses and a well and, uh, you know, and the bed and breakfast people would have loved that. Right? <laughs> Authentic experience. So I call I call it uh, preservation rehab. So we're, we're respecting all the character defining features or reproducing woodwork uh, where it's missing and, and, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I think that's I'll speak for Stacy. Maybe that's our general approach to I think I live in an 1865 house and I also don't want an outhouse or my kitchen in the basement so I'll take the modern conveniences here and there (laughs) we can't live we can't live in museums no but we need to respect the architecture so I put in you know Imelda Marcos when they deposed her husband in the Philippines they found a closet and she had like 900 pairs of shoes right that's my wife, Pat. So I had to take an entire room and create a walk-in closet for her clothes and stuff. Because when she married me, she'd been a professional in Chicago. And she was 46 years old when we got married. And she had spent all her money on clothes. You know? <laughs> so, and then we do uh, second floor laundries mm-hmm. and things like that. So Well, I always tell people they can take my dishwasher away when I'm dead. But other than that, that, that thing is mine. It runs two or three times a day. I have a big family and I will never give it up. We have two of them in the kitchen, so... Ooh, jealous. I'm jealous. <laughs> I guess I was curious, do you feel like the culture at large has become a little bit more familiar with the issue? Like, I think Stacy and I are so, like, in this world, too, that we know that an old wood window is far superior for 10,000 reasons to a vinyl one, but... It seems to me then when, that when you started talking about this in the 90s and 80s, like nobody agreed it's with worse. you. It's, it's gotten, gotten worse. worse. So it's, okay, that's too bad. So the last year that there's any decent data, like take windows, for example, nine and a half billion dollar industry uh, replacement windows. So you, if you extrapolate that, that's about 112 million window sashes that ended up in our landfills in 2019. Um, Now, what's interesting about that is it it looks like just under half of that, about 50 million of those are less than 20 years old. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, what does that say about replacement? And some of those are the second replacement ones. Right. So it's just uh, the the insanity. And the data is out there. Here's, Here's the thing. So 15 years ago, we were all... So many of us in the artisan trades were working independently, and then we kind of all joined together. Preservation Trades Network, a bunch of different ways that we do this. The Window Preservation Collaborative that I helped found, and all these different organizations. And we started sharing knowledge. Right. 
And we were all a little paranoid because, you know, we developed our own ways of doing it and everybody was wonderful. And, and now it's, it was collaborative then and now it's even 10 times more collaborative than it used to be, which I think is really important. The preservation movement is, it created the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. Right. There are people that claim it, you know, you've got lead programs, which is just, in my opinion, a scam to get more money out of houses. I could go into that for a long time about how we've looked at all leads, lead certified projects that have never, never gotten to their projected energy savings or anything like that. But the bottom line is that we're one of the most diverse movements in this country that started with a bunch of people going into dilapidated neighborhoods that wanted to live in a cool old house, couldn't afford to unless they did all the work themselves and there was nobody to teach you how. Mm -hmm. And so we just kind of learned it on our own to start with. Some people would say that we're aging out, but I'm not that old yet. So I haven't aged out yet, but, uh, (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, it's getting that way. So there's a new generations coming up. So what I'm seeing at the school and um, and my road workshops are all these Gen Xers and millennials mm-hmm. and over half of them that are coming into the business are women. And this is absolutely makes me want to cry. So it makes exciting. me so happy. Yeah. I have been mentoring women in this field all my life and to see them coming into these trades and droves is one of the most heartwarming things that I can think of because they for the guys out there, I love y'all, but the women, when they get this, when they get a chance to learn this, maybe their dads only spent time with their brother instead of with them because of, you know, how people thought back in a day. But once they get a hold of this, their skills exceed most of the men that I work with. Do you feel after all this time, after all your years in preservation, do you feel cynical or hopeful? I feel absolutely hopeful. I feel a hundred and fifty percent hopeful. I am hopeful because I'm seeing all these. What we wanted was all these young people coming into the trades and into the business, and they're coming in. Now we have to take that and we have to leverage that, and we have to train more and more and more and more and more people. So to every town of two hundred and fifty thousand people or fifty thousand people across the country has enough people doing the work so that people can get good work done and not throw away all all these wonderful elements of their old houses. And it starts to to really show that preservation doesn't cost a pace in so many ways. So So how could someone like Daniel and I leverage this, help you leverage this movement of preserving buildings? Well, first of all, we need the Department of Energy to stop being knuckleheads. I know. (laughs) Right. They give tax credits for vinyl windows, cheesy vinyl or aluminum storms. But we, you know, we present data to them about original windows and wood storms, and they don't even look Mm -hmm. good. And so, you know, you can't get a tax credit energy upgrades, which is restoring, weatherizing a window and doing a storm. That's an energy upgrade, right? But you can't get a tax credit for it. We need the homeowners to go, oh, if I keep those windows, I get a better tax credit than if I replace them. Well, you know, mm-hmm. we, so th- those that's one way that we can do it. So I love the Kentucky State Preservation Office. They're probably one of the, what, uh, sh- there's a lot of good SHPOs that I work with. Uh, that's the acronym for State Preservation Office. Yes. And, and we use a lot of acronyms, and I try to always, you know, tag the acronym after I actually say what I'm going to say. But the Kentucky uh, SHPO has done a, a great job. And they had an architect friend of mine. He passed away. But what he would do is he built these models of historic houses that you could open up, kind of like miniature doll houses. And he would go into kindergartens and grades, and first grade, second grade classes and talk about the excitement and the magic of architecture and you get those kids tuned up and then they start growing up and then they start embracing it. And then I think that we need to say to them what my father said to me when I was about six years old, which is sitting at, at, at the bench with him. Cause I would, he was an old house weekend warrior and a, and a woodworker and I would do anything to hang out with him. And we're at the bench building something. And he says to me, we don't own this house. And I burst out crying. I'm like, we're moving. I don't understand. You know, it's this great arts and crafts house that mom calls it an arts and crafts style house. And it's got a clay tile roof and it's brick and it's got balconies and all these cubby holes. And it's the most greatest family home in the world. Why are we moving? He says, no, no, no. Calm down. Calm down. We're not moving. You can go down to the courthouse. I'll tell you we own it. But don't you ever think that you own this house. My father was a, a, an extremely conservative Republican. 
my mother was a feminist leftist, which was very interesting at dinner. But anyway, yeah. my dad said, we have a responsibility to do quality work to this house. So the next family can enjoy it as much as we have. And that's called stewardship. And that's why we always do things right, Bob. And don't you ever forget it. The community owns this house as much as we do as individuals. And in so many ways, we become so individualistic in this country that we've forgotten that we're also a, a democratic republic where we join together and we value certain things and certain landmarks within our communities. And I think we need to embrace our heritage so that we're smarter in the future. I think that's an excellent place to stop for this particular episode, for this part one. Bob, this has just been a joy. And we're going to have you back for a part two, which I'm very excited about because we didn't even hit the actual topic <laughs> that I had written down. And that thrills me. That absolutely thrills me. If, if anyone should be a guest on a two-parter, it is you, Bob Yab. So thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. Two parts. Wow. <laughs> All right. Thanks again. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you for listening to True Tales from Old Houses. And thank you to our guests today, Wendy Pettit and Bob Yap. To continue the conversation, which we would love, join us on Facebook and Instagram at True Tales from Old Houses. You can follow Stacy at Blake Hill House on Instagram and myself at Daniel Cantor. In addition to learn more about everything we discussed in today's episode or request a transcript, visit truetalesfromoldhouses.com. Until next time. Later, alligator. Alligator.